The Last of Us Part 2 is the last Jedi of gaming. I don't think there's ever been less of a consensus on whether a game's good or not than this one. On one hand, I totally get why some people love this game, because it takes ballsy risks and dares to be so depressing. And on the other hand, I totally get why some people just hate this game, because it takes ballsy risks and dares to be so depressing. Uh, but one thing that I think we can all agree on is that Naughty Dog has divided its fandom. All you have to do is scroll down and look at the several thousand arguments going on in the comments section to see proof of that. And what is really clear is that Naughty Dog did something wrong. Uh, they had to, otherwise this game wouldn't have alienated as many players as it did. Um, the purpose of this feature length video essay is to fully and comprehensively explain why this game cleaved its player base into two, with about half of this game's players thinking it's a brilliant piece of art and the other half thinking it's a hot pile of garbage. And in order to do this I've settled on having three parts. Uh, the first will be a short one, all about about the main terrible mistake that Naughty Dog made that caused this divide in the first place. And funnily enough, it has nothing to do with whether or not this game is of good quality or not. Uh, but part two is the autopsy. Uh, this is a full deconstruction of the story where I'll highlight the mistakes made in terms of writing. Uh, everything from why the story felt like a drag to play in some places, to why some players had a really hard time connecting with certain characters, despite how hard Naughty Dog tried to make us like them. And part three is all about how it could have been done better. In part Part 3, I'll pitch an alternate story for The Last of Us 2 which addresses the issues I raise in this video, so do stick around for that. And with all that out of the way, let's move on to Part 1, Druckmann's Biggest Mistake. There's nothing objectively wrong with having a game story be as, well, let's not mince words here, as overwhelmingly depressing as The Last of Us Part 2, but when it comes to the negative backlash that this game is getting, even though not all of it, but a good amount is coming from the personal preference of players not liking depressing stories, I firmly believe that Neil Druckmann and Naughty Dog deserve the vast majority of the negative backlash they're getting. Let me explain why. One thing that The Last of Us Part 2 demonstrates really quite well is it's possible to develop such a tunnel vision as you focus on serving a specific target audience that sure, you please that audience, but at the same time you alienate everyone who isn't in that audience. And with The Last of Us 2 it was clearly aimed at people who love and enjoy stories with bleak depressing tones, the kind of story where there is no hope that the protagonist might overcome their demons, and where every step of the journey is all downhill with no light at the end of the tunnel. And normally, I'm an advocate for that. I know most of you watching the Close Look at Writers, and to you all, here's some advice. It's a great idea to choose a specific audience and write just for them. As the age old saying goes, if you try to please everyone, you please no one. But Neil Druckmann, the creative director of The Last of Us 2, made a terrible mistake, because he believed that this philosophy applied to him. And why didn't it apply to him? Because he was making a sequel. The first game is all about Joel, the cynical old man meeting Ellie, the naive optimistic girl, and the story follows them both as they fall in love, as they grow to trust each other, and both of them improve the other. That's what the first game was all about, this heartwarming tale of paternal love. But if The Last of Us 1 wasn't about that, and was instead about a miserable man struggling to survive in the apocalypse, meeting a girl and then dragging her down to his level, then making her equally as depraved a person as him, if the first game were far darker and far bleaker than what we got, the response to this second one would have been immeasurably more positive. Why? Because in that theoretical version, the target audience was consistent. What Neil Druckmann did here was a mistake, not in terms of actual craft, but in terms of managing an audience as a creator, because he had two options. He could either make The Last of Us 2 not the same as the first, it's got a new plot, new characters and it takes creative risks, but it fully embodies the first where it has the same tone, explores an equally as positive theme and is a natural continuation of the first game story, and in doing that Druckmann would have pleased the vast majority of the people who enjoyed the first game. However, he chose to tell a depressing tale Tale, knowing it went totally against why people loved the first game. And sure, some people who loved the first game loved the second, after all there's always an overlap between target audiences, but he knew it would result in roughly half of the people really excited to see this sequel hating this sequel story. What kind of creator actively chooses to disappoint their fans? 
And I know what some of you might be thinking, but it's not a question of creative liberty. Because I hate to say it, but when you make a sequel, you just can't have as much liberty as you did when you made that first story, because that first story set a precedent, and it's one that you have to stick to. Otherwise, you'll stray too far from what made people like the first one. Otherwise, you'll create The Last of Us Part 2. Personally, in my undeniably biased opinion as a writer myself, I think Druckmann telling one story where the tone is filled with such hope, has such a positive theme and tone, and then making a follow-up that is the total opposite in those respects, was a terrible creative decision. Not because it had any effect on the actual quality of this game, but because that's just not how you manage an audience as a creator. Because it creates preventable disappointment and division in your fanbase. Anyway, now that I've entered my rather harsh feelings, let's move on to a proper traditional breakdown of The Last of Us 2's writing. From now on, I'll be building up a short list of all the flaws and mistakes this game's narrative makes. Hopefully I'll be shining a light on any issues that you noticed but couldn't quite put into words, and then in part 3 I'll use all of these mistakes I noticed to create that pitch for an alternate story. So part 2. The Autopsy. It's worth saying that none of these issues I'm about to bring up alone will ever ruin a story. But when you have multiple, and in The Last of Us 2's case, when you have 11 main flaws, they multiply on top of each other and come together to take a great big cumulative hit on how engaging the story is. And it's worth saying that every story in the world has flaws, and nothing is perfect. I loved Interstellar, I'd say it's my personal favourite film, but Christ, some of the dialogue in that film was really on the nose, and that space library scene was just head scratching on a first viewing. Every story has flaws. This is just me pointing out what this ones are, and it just so happens that there are so many of them that I've had to make this video as long as it is to properly explain them. So I often get questions from writers asking how I'm able to break down stories the way I do, and what's my secret for analysing a plot or a character, and my answer's always the same. It's no more complex than spending a lot of time consuming other people's stories, writing your own, and quite importantly, filling your head with as much knowledge as you can about creative writing. Now when it comes to that second one of actually writing stories, I can't help you there because that one's up to you, but when it comes to finding great stories to enjoy and learn from, and finding a ton of non-fiction material all about storycraft, I can help you there because a fantastic place to find both is Audible, who I can happily thank for sponsoring today's video. Now most brand deals feel really impersonal, where the YouTuber just reads off a checklist of talking points and it's clear that they don't actually care about the brand. That's not the case today, because I truly believe that Audible is a fantastic place for writers to be because they have so many great stories to learn from, as well as audiobooks specifically on how to write great fiction that I found invaluable. Like I'm not kidding when I say that I use Audible every day because I find their service just so convenient and useful. If you're interested in writing Writing, I cannot recommend Stephen King's On Writing enough. Uh, the book is essentially King's memoir, but it has a ton of tips and advice on writing sprinkled in throughout the entire audiobook, which I found really useful, and also it's narrated by Stephen King himself, which is a lovely bonus, like very few writers bother to narrate their own books. And if you want to check On Writing out, all you have to do is either click my link in the description, that's audible.com forward slash closer look, or text closer look to 500 500. If you do either of those, you'll get a free 30 day trial plus a free credit that you can use to buy any audiobook you like on their platform. Like, and if you want to use that credit to buy some absurdly thick fantasy book like The Way of Kings, I, I, I can't blame you because you basically be getting like almost 50 hours of really good entertainment totally for free, but I think that getting Stephen King's on writing would be a really good way to spend that credit. And all you have to do to get started is click my link in the description, that's audible.com forward slash closer look, or text closer look to find 500 500 and get your free audiobook today. Okay, so ad break over, where better to start than what's one of the most complained about and what I feel is the single most problematic issue with this game. A sloppy structure. So I've seen a lot of reviewers saying that the non-linear narrative was just too hard to follow and that's the cause of this story's pacing issues. 
But I wholeheartedly disagree, because 100% you can have a story full of flashbacks and multiple timelines and still have it be really engaging. So uh, for those of you who haven't played it, this game has two main timelines between Ellie in the present day and then Abby three days in the past. Not to mention that the whole thing is interlaced with dozens upon dozens of flashbacks. The truth is, the fact there are multiple timelines is not the problem here. A Dunkirk, for example, is a film with four separate plots following four protagonists, and all of these plots happen hours or days apart from the other. And while that film's structure was undeniably complex, and it has twice as many timelines as The Last of Us 2, Nolan still told a well-structured, engaging story. And yes, in case you couldn't tell, I have a bit of a man crush on Christopher Nolan. But the real cause of why the structure of this game just doesn't work is the rising action. For those of you who don't know, rising action is basically the narrative tension. It's the way conflict builds as the story goes along. In any well-structured plot, the rising action will look like this. The story starts off pretty calm, then the inciting incident happens and kicks off the plot, and from here the conflict builds like a snowball rolling down a hill until the tension is so high that the climax happens, and then there's a gradual wind down as the story ties up its loose ends. Rising action is a universal thing in storytelling. It doesn't matter what your genre is or what your target audience audiences or hell what medium you're telling the story in, your story simply needs rising action. On this, there's a reason why when you watch a movie with two plot lines, you'll have a scene or two with Frodo, then a scene or two with Aragorn, then back to Frodo, then Aragorn, and so on like that, until the story ends. Because if you spent the entire story following just Frodo and Sam, all the way up until halfway through the trilogy when they've reached Mount Doom, and then you suddenly stop, go back, and then we see what Aragorn was doing the whole time, and then we spend essentially the rest of the trilogy following just Aragorn until he catches up with Frodo at the end, there's a reason why you don't see that happen very often in fiction, because it's almost impossible to do that and maintain a good rising action. I say almost because I really hate to say that anything's absolute in writing, but I've yet to see a story that attempts this and actually pulls it off. Okay, so if we had to plot the rising action of The Last of Us 2, it would look like this. Honestly, the first half of the game with Ellie is pretty decent. We have a quiet opening as we introduce all the characters, then wham, Joel dies. There's our inciting incident which makes Ellie go out on her revenge mission. And then as she goes out, the narrative tension rises as she gets close to Abby, then after stabbing plenty of cuddly dogs, we finally meet Abby and it feels like the climax is just about to happen, then the rising action goes down so fast, it's literally a vertical line. We have now switched protagonists to Abby, and the next 10 hours of gameplay is following just her in the days before Ellie's plot even started. And this is a point we'll look at in a moment, but because Abby's half of the story isn't working towards an overall objective, rather she's doing what feels like a series of side quests all placed back to back, Abby has no real sense of rising action in her story because she doesn't actually have a goal she's working towards. So for Abby, because her story is so directionless, the narrative tension is mostly just a straight line for about 8 hours of gameplay, until she finally finds the bodies of her friends that Ellie killed, then it finally shoots up, she almost immediately fights Ellie, we have a climactic fight, and then we have our epilogue where things wind down, but oh no, Ellie still wants Abby dead, so then the rising action goes back up again, and then we have a second climax, and then it goes down when the story ends. Um, what you're seeing on screen is an abomination of story structure. What would have been a far better execution of this story was to do what books and movies have been doing for hundreds of years and tell the two stories in parallel, where we have an hour as Ellie, then an hour as Abby, then Ellie, then Abby, and so on back and forth, until the climax happens and resolves everything which removes the need for that second climax, and then the story ends. If they did something like that, it would have made the structure look far closer to the ideal one that I just described earlier, as both plots harmonise together and both build to the same climax at the same time, instead of feeling like two completely different stories told back to back. But in traditional structure, there's a moment called a midpoint, which funnily enough happens at the middle of the story. Uh, the midpoint is the moment the dynamic of the story shifts. Uh, this narrative beat twists things up and keeps things fresh. In Captain America, throughout the beginning of the movie, he's been extremely passive and has done nothing but react whenever something happens. In this movie's midpoint, Steve finally becomes an active character, seeks out the Red Skull, and begins to fight on the front lines as a soldier. In The Dark Knight, the midpoint point is when the Joker is finally captured, and the film stops being all about catching the Joker, and it becomes him enacting his evil plan. In Gladiator, the midpoint is when Maximus removes his helmet, reveals his identity to the world, and this begins the Emperor's scheme to kill Maximus off. 
The midpoint is a staple narrative device used so frequently that if you were to open up your favourite film and skip to the middle, there's like a 90% chance that you'd land on a midpoint where the whole dynamic of the story changes up. And that's not to say it's a cliche that you should avoid, it's a genuinely useful beat to add in to stop your plot from stagnating. And with this game, Druckmann added in a midpoint but at the same time fundamentally misunderstood what a midpoint actually actually is. With all these examples I just listed, they use the midpoint really quite well by changing something about the status quo, but they do it by continuing the story, not restarting the story. The whole idea behind the midpoint is it's supposed to be like shifting gear, like allowing the rising action that's been jogging along so far to really build up speed in the final sprint towards the climax. And as you can see from the structure on the screen, the midpoint in this story is actually self-defeating because it does the opposite of what it should be doing. And I did just say that we touch on it, so let's talk about Abby's plot. Not her character, we'll talk about that later, but what her character does in the story. When I was playing as Abby, it was when she was fetching medical supplies with the woman with the broken arm, which was at this point in the game, a point where any story should be building up towards the climax. This was when I finally realised that there is something horribly wrong with Abby's plot. She doesn't actually have a plot. So really quick, let me summarise Abby's story. First, Abby's messing around in her home base with no real direction. Then she goes out on patrol for about an hour of gameplay. And then she meets Isaac, the leader of her faction. Then she hears that her friend Owen's in trouble, so she goes up to speak to him. And then we have a half hour long, largely pointless flashback that only serves the purpose of giving exposition about Abby's relationship with Owen. Then we spend a long time going through the city to reach Owen, but oh no, Abby's been ambushed and kidnapped. Then we have another flashback to Owen. This one tells there's nothing that the first one didn't already tell us. Then we go back to see Abby nearly die, but she gets saved by a girl and her little brother. Then we have this grand escape scene. Then after all of this, Abby finally finds Owen, they have a romance scene, or what I guess passes for romance these days, and then she goes back to check on those two people who saved her life. Do you get what I'm saying in that Abby has no plot? It's a common complaint that Abby's story felt like a drag to play. Well this is the reason. Abby doesn't have a goal. She has no overall motivation. All we do is see her bumbling around Seattle for about 10 hours doing a string of side quests and once all of her side quests are complete, she then bumps into Ellie and it's like an entirely new plot begins as she hunts Ellie down when before she wasn't even remotely interested in hunting Ellie down. Abby Abby's story would have been overwhelmingly more fun to play if she were actually doing something. Like if her faction's leader had given her an impossible yet also a highly important mission where the stakes are high and Abby's story is her acting out this mission and getting closer to her end goal with every passing second. And then we can have Ellie get in the way of the final step of her mission. So that's why Abby fights Ellie in the end, where it feels like it's a natural culmination of everything Abby's been doing in the story and not something she decides to do on a whim when she finds her dead friends. Because of this lack of direction, Abby's story has an unbearable amount of filler, and that drags the pacing way down. Like at one point, that woman who saved Abby needs her arm to be amputated to save her life. So then Abby goes on a detour to get a simple bag of medical supplies to do the procedure. Uh, she goes through the city, then climbs a skyscraper, then crosses two cranes, then climbs down a skyscraper, killing infected all along the way, where she finally reaches the hospital. But <laughs> tricked you because it's not that easy because the only place they can find the equipment is in an overrun basement so then she has to skulk through an infected basement she finally finds the supplies then she has a great big boss battle and then finally she gets the equipment back to the nurse so she can do the procedure this entire section of the story was a glorified fetch quest and all in all how long did this fetch quest take two hours which is longer than most movies. And do you want to know the best part? In the very next mission, that woman who you spent so much time trying to save gets shot. And she dies. And I try to be unbiased with these videos, but I, I really can't. I have to let my rather aggravated opinion slip through just a little bit. When this happened, I wanted to punch clean through my monitor because it felt like the game had just wasted two hours of my time. 
When a movie has one or two scenes that don't add to the overall plot, it's a little annoying and has a small negative effect on the pacing. But when it's a story driven game and that pointless section is two hours long, it's unbearable for the player because there is such a total lack of a sense of progression in the story. People have been complaining that Abbey story is a drag to play, well this is the reason why. Because if you went through Abbey's section of the game, which is about 10 hours long, you could cut it down into being 4 hours long and the story would still make total sense with no holes in it because that's just how much time was wasted doing redundant side quests. I'm not saying that they should have made Abby's story four hours long, but I am saying that Abby's story, her motivation, what her objective is throughout the whole game needs a fundamental overhaul. And it's one that I'll endeavour to address in part three of this video. One thing that's also worth bringing up is how there is no sense of urgency in this story. Whenever there's some form of ticking clock, when it's a situation where the protagonist has to get involved in the story because if they don't do this, X terrible thing will happen, it inherently adds another level of suspense to a story, as this dreadful thing is getting closer to happening the further we go along in the story. With Ellie, what's the rush to hunt these people down? Uh, she could hunt Abby down now, or she could wait for two years and get revenge then. And if a lead turns out to be a dead end, why should we care? Why, why can't Ellie just calmly bide her time for about two or three months until another lead comes up and then she pursues that one? Where is the sense of urgency? Also, the exact same applies to Abby here. Granted, at the end of her story, there is a little bit of urgency where Lev goes back to his island, puts himself in danger, and then she needs to go and save him. But for the most part, Abby's story doesn't have this. So that's another point on the list. And finally, on the matter of plot, don't worry, there's still so much more to say about the character in this game, but finally on the matter of plot, we have to talk about the pointless flashbacks that add nothing to the story. Here's the thing. Flashbacks are a little bit like spice with a dish. It's nice to have some every now and then, especially when it complements the overall story, but too many flashbacks, just like too much spice, is a bad thing for the overall meal. The reason why is because in a perfectly structured story, every scene should be indispensable to the plot. Every scene should have a knock-on effect where the events of one scene directly cause the next, and so on, until the story ends. The problem with The Last of Us 2's flashbacks is the majority of them don't do any of the above. Now don't get me wrong, some of them do a good job at advancing the themes of the story, uh, some of them do a good job at exploring Joel's and Ellie's relationship, but almost none of them have anything to do with the plot itself. The only one that I can think of that does is the one with Abby where it tells us about her father and her motivations for killing Joel. Yes, some of the flashbacks, if you look at them just on their own, are lovely and really fun and heartwarming, but when you take a step back and look at them in light of the overall plot, most of them are largely redundant, and some of them are entirely redundant. And the fact that there are so many inconsequential flashbacks means that the pacing of this story takes a big damaging hit. Now let's move on to character. Going on from what I said about flashbacks, a lot of them heavily feature Ellie and Joel. So let's address the elephant in the room. This is not a fresh point, but if we're breaking down this game, it simply needs to be addressed. Joel's death. So to summarise the average argument between people debating if Joel dying in the beginning of this game was bad or not, the first person will say, I think it was dumb. And then the second person, literally every single time, says, oh, you're just annoyed because they killed a character that you loved. Get over it. And from there the argument devolves to a point where if I had to say the next parts aloud, I'd probably get demonetised. <laughs> but standing back, uh, putting personal opinions to one side, there is a compelling argument for why killing Joel at the beginning of the game was a bad decision. And it goes like this. Yes, Druckmann wanted to tell a revenge story. Yes, in order for that to happen, Ellie needs a reason to want revenge. But that doesn't change the fact that because Joel is dead, it severely undermines how good this game can be as a sequel. The Last of Us 1 was Ellie's and Joel's relationship. Uh, the infection, the fireflies, the hunt for the cure, the trek across America, all of that was secondary to Ellie and Joel, specifically Joel, because he's the protagonist and the one who undergoes the arc. The dynamic between Ellie and Joel is the foundation of the first game's story. And the reason why what they did to Joel was a mistake wasn't because they killed off a beloved character, it's totally fine in fiction to kill beloved characters, but because if Dropman were to assemble a list, 
list of the absolute must-haves for The Last of Us 2. The, the things that no matter what, this game can't be a good sequel. Not necessarily be a bad story, but be a bad sequel if they aren't thoroughly explored. The relationship between Ellie and Joel would have taken the number one spot. But it can't be explored, because Joel's dead. Yes, some of the flashbacks did help to alleviate this issue, but they only give us a minimal exploration of Ellie's and Joel's relationship. Certainly, it's nowhere near deep enough an exploration to satisfy what so many players were craving. And as I said earlier, they bogged down the pace of the story. Uh, the reason why is because these flashbacks only explore Ellie's and Joel's relationship. That's one thing, that, that's one purpose, when really any good scene should be doing far more than just one thing. If instead Joel were alive throughout The Last of Us 2, that would have actually helped cure a lot of this game's pacing issues, because now we can dispose of most of those flashbacks as we can explore their relationship, while at the same time advancing the plot and giving the story far more of a forward momentum. On Joel dying, if instead of him dying at the start, Joel dies at the end of The Last of Us 2, or if throughout the lengthy game we have a chance to see the fallout from the first, how Ellie finds out what Joel did and then she pushes him away and hates him completely, and then we see their relationship degrade and progress over the story as Ellie struggles to forgive him, or Joel as he struggles to regain her trust, and then at the end of this full exploration of their relationship, when they finally resolve their angst and Ellie's forgiven him, then Joel dies, almost nobody would have had a problem with that. This is why people pulling out the argument of, oh, you're just annoyed because they killed a character you love, doesn't hold much water, uh, because Joel could have been killed in a totally different way, and the very people complaining about Joel's death would have absolutely loved how it was done. Whether or not that's my opinion, I'll put to one side and not say, but it's definitely an interesting argument nonetheless, so it's definitely an issue worth putting down for the rewrite. So when the final fight between Ellie and Abby came along, when I was made to play as Abby, by pure instinct I snuck along the cover to go and hide, but then I realised, hold on, I actually want Abby to die. I'm not even slightly engaged with her character, so I stood up and let Ellie kill her, in some vague hope that it would change the narrative and make Ellie win the fight. And it wasn't just me who tried to sabotage Abby here, a PewDiePie did this, H2O Delirious did this, so did the Radbrat, Angry Joe as well, also T. Martin and Goldglove, despite playing as Abby, were actually cheering on Ellie in the fight whenever she hurt Abby, and they voiced several times how much they wanted the person they were playing as to lose. One thing that this really clearly shows is that Naughty Dog failed to get a large portion of their audience to care about Abby's character, despite how much they tried. The question is, why? Uh, why did the audience just have a bloody hard time rooting for Abby? Well, if you ask me, it's because Abby is a poorly handled, unlikable character, and also Ellie is as well, so we might as well kill two birds with one stone and address both of them at the same time. With Ellie, uh, she goes around murdering people throughout the whole game, uh, she kills floofy dogs, and threatens to murder an injured, unconscious child? Really? O okay. Not even slightly close to the Ellie we remember in the first game, but okay, fine. She even murders a pregnant woman at one point. Like, during her whole portion of the story, Ellie does some despicably evil things. And when we learn a little more context as we play Abby's side of the story, we see that actually the people Ellie were murdering, like, aren't really that bad as people. It's safe to say that Ellie is an unlikable character. And with Abby, do I need do I even need to explain why she's unlikable? Nice shot! In this game, Ellie and Abby are unlikable, but that's not actually the problem, because you can write the most arsehole character in all of creation and still make them work really well as a protagonist, but the real trick to pulling this off lies in motivation. When writing a protagonist who does evil things, the best way to execute this is to make the motivation as sympathetic as is humanly possible. A character who does evil things purely because she hates a group of people and loves watching them scream and die in agony, and on top of that we know that those people aren't actually really that evil, it's inherently unengaging for the audience, because it's just hard for such a detestable, hateful, destructive motivation to resonate with us as an audience. Not possible, just, just really hard. But an asshole who does the most evil things murders so many good people, not out of hate, but out of love, because her son's life is on the line, or her best friend is in dire need of help, or she truly 
genuinely believes that she's making the world a better place, and she's being an unlikable prick in order to achieve her end goal that's positive in nature. Now that's an asshole I can get behind, and please don't quote me on that one out of context. Um, but that's the key to writing unlikable protagonists, a thoroughly relatable, sympathetic motivation. Don't believe me? Look at Joel in The First Last of Us. I'd argue that he's one of the best unlikable protagonists in all of gaming. Like, in the final mission of The Last of Us, Joel murders the people who up until that point in the story we've been led to believe were the good guys. Like, we as the player know that the fireflies in this building are just people, like not bandits, like none of them have actually tried to kill you and an argument can be made that that doctor is actually a good person simply forced into a difficult decision and he's a guy with humanity's best interests at heart. And Joel massacres them and it totally works. Like, the player isn't alienated, they're still engaged with Joel's story despite how reluctant they might be to do these evil things, because why is Joel murdering all of these soldiers and doctors? He's doing it out of love. Because Ellie is the person that he loves the most in the world, and if he doesn't kill these people, Ellie dies. He's already lost one daughter, he's not losing another. How can the player not sympathise with Joel in this moment? And with Ellie and Abby, I'm not saying it's impossible to be engaged by their characters, because clearly some people really were, but it's just so much harder to be engaged with their story because they're being monsters for the sake of a monstrous motivation. And talking further about motivation, if your story has two protagonists who are supposed to care about, but they're both pitted against each other and are fighting the other, there are many kinds of stories you can tell with a dynamic like that. A revenge story is, I don't want to say not one of them, but it's just not a good fit for that dynamic. And the reason why is a revenge story only works if there's a bad guy to get revenge on, someone that the protagonist and the audience really wants to see dead because they're just such a bastard. Uh, in John Wick, the guy who killed his dog is the bad bad guy. Nothing more, nothing less. And when John aims at Theon, but chooses to spare him because death by bullet is just too quick, we as the audience get a great big grin on our faces because we want to see what kind of horrific slow death John has in mind because the bad guy is just so detestable. Like, imagine if in an alternate universe's John Wick, after Theon Greyjoy kills John's dog, we have five scenes showing how nice he is as a person, he's giving money to the homeless and is generally being a lovable guy. The film makes an active effort to really get you to like him as a character. Well, I feel sorry for that universe because their version of John Wick is infinitely worse. Because if we did start to like the bad guy, it would undermine how much we want to see John get his revenge, therefore it would undermine the audience's engagement with the story, therefore the story would be less entertaining. And if you're thinking that that universe's version of John Wick sounds really familiar, well, there's a reason for that, because that is The Last of Us Part 2. Yes, Neil Druckmann tried to make us like Abby in an attempt to spoil our engagement with Ellie's revenge story, but here's the problem that creates. It causes us to not be engaged with Ellie's revenge story anymore. The reason why revenge plots just don't work in stories with two protagonists pitted against each other is because if we start to like character A, we become disinterested in character B because all they want to do is kill character A whom we like and vice versa. Why would we give a damn about Abby's mission to kill Ellie in the climax when we like Ellie more than Abby? That's why so many people try to sabotage her in that part of the game. Funnily enough, like my novel which I'm writing right now has a similar dynamic to The Last of Us 2 in that it has two protagonists, both of which are the other's antagonists. And I'm not bringing this up as some sort of like shameless plug, but because in writing this story and workshopping it and giving it out to beta readers, I've learned a really valuable lesson. If you're telling this kind of story, by far the best way to do it is to make the audience truly root for and sympathise with both protagonists. How it's so we really care about and want both to succeed. And this creates a kind of tragic irony because the audience is invested in both characters but their goals are incompatible. We know that one of them will lose in the end, it's just a question of which. An example of what they could have done, we can still have Abby be Ellie's villain and vice versa, but instead have it so neither of them want revenge, instead they want something else, something more sympathetic. I do realise that this would have been a completely different story to be honest, but it's a story with the exact same dynamic 
dynamic that would have been far easier to be invested in. Like, what if Abby's plot was all about assisting the greater good by helping society as a whole, and Ellie's plot is all about her achieving a personal good like helping someone she loves? Like, we really understand where both characters are coming from. Uh, one is guided by a strong sense of responsibility, the other by love for a family member. We sympathise with both, however, these two motivations are at odds with each other, and it's impossible for both characters to win in the end. If they told that story, far more players would have been engaged with both protagonists because even though they're unlikable pricks, what they both want is so relatable in nature that we can't help but be engaged by their journeys. Also another one, Ellie has no character arc. Now it's not a death sentence to have a static protagonist in a story, but any writer who takes on that undertaking is fighting an uphill battle because part of the reason why we love stories in the first place as humans is to see characters learn lessons and overcome their internal demons. If your character has no character arc, you're removing part of the base reason why people enjoy stories in the first place. There is one moment in the very end of the game where Ellie shows change as he chooses to spare Abby, but because this moment had no build up, it feels more like Ellie just suddenly decides to not want revenge anymore, and in light of this happening after a full game's worth of wanting nothing but revenge, calling this an arc is extremely generous. And if you think I'm done pointing out issues with the characters in this game, like god I haven't even started yet, a lot of people are saying that this game has lazy writing, and I think this next bit is what they're referring to. It's a flaw that I like to call poor character verisimilitude, or in less pretentious terms, characters routinely making decisions and mistakes that are inconsistent with who they are. When you're writing a story with an outline, where you have your plan for the whole plot set out in stone, it's possible that this can have a disastrous effect on how good your characters are, because sometimes if you stick to your outline, you'll force your characters to make decisions and mistakes they would have otherwise never made, because that's the only way to advance the plot. And when a character does this, where they act out of character for the sake of the plot, they feel fake and the audience sees clear as day the strings of the writer as they manipulate the characters to do their bidding. Simply put, at an unforgivable amount of points in this story, characters don't feel like people, they feel more like puppets at the whims of the writer, and make decisions inconsistent with either their character or basic common sense because the plot demands for that thing to happen. For example, Joel is a man who is desperately cynical. If there's anyone in the world of the Last of Us that would be untrusting of strangers, it would be Joel. In the first game, when Joel sees that man injured in the street begging for help, his first instinct is to assume that it's a trap, and he was right. And when Joel, a veteran survivor, outnumbered 7-2 to two by complete strangers, doesn't stand in a tactically advantageous spot, like in a corner or by a doorway with an easy escape route, but rather stands in the open with a relaxed posture as if everything's fine. Also on top of that, he says his name out loud when he knows that a lot of people in this world are outgunning for him, when Joel just trusts that these random strangers have no ill intentions, it's entirely out of character. Uh, the reason why this happened? Druckmann wanted him to die, and in order for him to do that, Joel needed to forget his survival instincts, otherwise he would have survived. A few people have been saying as a counter-argument for this that, well, Joel spent four years living in the safety of Jackson, he would have therefore forgotten his survival instincts after not needing to rely on them for so long. Unfortunately, that's not how storytelling works. Like, if that were the angle Druckmann were going for, in order to do that right, he'd need to add in more foreshadowing that this is the case. Uh, he would need to show that Joel is rusty before this moment. Uh, perhaps he makes a rookie mistake earlier in the game, and then Tommy comments about how he's losing his touch. Unfortunately, they didn't add in any foreshadowing that Joel was losing his survival instincts, uh, so this moment comes across as lazy writing. And when you start looking for them, like the amount of moments like this where characters are inconsistent for the sake of the plot, it's mind-blowing how many there are. Another example, Abby has proven throughout the story that she is someone who takes revenge and has no qualms about killing. There's a reason why she travelled all the way across the country to kill Joel, because hate and anger are just a fundamental part of who she is. I mean, there's a point in the story where Abby is forced to kill people on her side in order to survive, like the group she's been 
been a part of for years, she slaughters them in the dozens, like people who were her friends and allies less than a day ago, and Abby doesn't give one remark, not one passing line of, oh no, what have I done? She acts like a total psychopath, like killing dozens of her own allies is just another day at the office. Abby is the most bloodthirsty, remorseless protagonist I've seen in gaming. Like even Kratos showed restraint in the last game when Boulder started threatening him, while Abby in that same situation would have taken the chance to test out her new nine iron on Boulder's cheek. And when Abby has a knife to Dina's throat near the end of the story, this happens. She's pregnant. Good. And this makes Abby the most unlikable prick in the world, but it's consistent with her character. And then the kid says her name and gives her a look. And the simple act of a look is enough for Abby to completely defy her personality, like the one she's consistently shown throughout the game, and she spares both Dina and Ellie, despite the fact that they both just murdered all, like like literally every single friend she had earlier that day, and despite the fact that they both clearly want Abby to be dead too, and like her sparing them is just begging for them to try and kill her again, which funnily enough is exactly what happens. If at least she'd expressed guilt just one time over any of the hundreds of lives she's taken, that would have made this moment light years better. Only Abby is consistently remorseless throughout the entire story, and has never once expressed guilt. So if this doesn't come across as an authentic moment where she's learned a lesson as a person, it instead comes across as Dina and Ellie both have plot armour because Drakwen wanted them to be in the epilogue with the baby. In the very end, Ellie set out to kill Abby, so she finally finds her all crucified, all nice and vulnerable, with no way to fight back, but instead of just shooting her there and then, Ellie cuts her down, and then lets Abby escape? What? Why? Why is Ellie actually helping Abby escape, when the whole purpose of her coming there was to kill the woman? And even better, it just it just gets worse from here on out, when they're in the water and Ellie goes up to Abby to finally finish it, she chooses to do it with a knife. But here's the problem, Ellie has guns. In her backpack, the one she just put down in the boat, like she has dozens of guns, all of which would finish Abby really very quickly. But instead, she puts her life in extreme danger by challenging Abby to a hand-to-hand -hand fight. Why does Ellie do all of these things and act as illogically as she does? Because Neil Druckmann wanted a quick time fist fight event in the water, and that wouldn't have been possible if Ellie showed a modicum of common sense and just shot Abby while she was all tied up. Okay, there are so many more examples, like, so many more. One more example, Tommy begins the story by saying, No, revenge is bad, Ellie. You have a good laugh here. Don't ruin it by seeking revenge. And then he ends the story by saying, Yes, revenge is good, Ellie. You have a good laugh here, but you should ruin it by going for revenge. And on top of that, Tommy actually has no character arc presented to explain why he's changed his opinions, so it makes no sense. And then there's another one where Ellie conveniently forgets common sense and leaves behind her map on top of the corpse of one of Abby's friend's bodies, which Abby very easily conveniently finds later on, and then she uses it to track Ellie down. But you get my point. So many things in this story are contrived. When you're a writer, you need to strike the perfect balance between plot and character, where it feels like the characters are the ones pushing the plot, not the plot pushing the characters. Otherwise, it will destroy the audience's suspension of disbelief, and it makes the characters feel fake. And this game, without a shadow of a doubt, failed to achieve this. So now we're coming towards the end of part two and gearing up for the rewrite. But as one final flaw to sign it all off, we need to talk not about Ellie or Abby, but about the characters that surround them. It's a common complaint that Dina and Jesse just don't work. And the new characters they introduce in Jackson, like Dina, they're okay, but mostly uninteresting. The supporting cast in this game fails at doing what it needs to do. And the game does try its best to make me care with snippets of their history, but that was nowhere close to being as riveting as the tension of Joel and Ellie's complicated relationship. The supporting cast doesn't work. And to answer why, uh, Dina was added in almost as if to be the Sam to Ellie's Frodo, and then you throw Jesse into the mix to make a trinity. It just feels natural to compare them to Frodo, Sam, and Gollum, and ask why that entourage worked so well, and why the one with Ellie, Dina, and Jesse, well, didn't. 
When a supporting character is a good one, it's because they bring utility to the story. There are many ways of doing this, and the more each supporting character brings to the table, the better they get. Uh, they might assist the themes of the story, they might introduce conflict, or have a direct effect on the plot. And one that I think's a really good use is when they influence the protagonist's arc. If you look at Lord of the Rings, Frodo's whole journey is about him fighting the evils inside of him, and Sam and Gollum are pretty much perfect companions for this, as Sam acts as the angel over Frodo's shoulder, and Gollum is the devil. Sam is the personification of all that's good in Frodo, Gollum is all that's bad. This fits Frodo's internal struggle like a glove, and not only does this add in lovely conflict, which is something that any good entourage needs, which is something that Ellie's supporting cast doesn't provide, but it adds a whole other layer to the story, as what each character does signifies Frodo's internal struggle in that moment. Uh, when Gollum first appears, that signals the start of Frodo's temptation and fall to the darkness. Uh, when Gollum spreads the elven breadcrumbs over Sam and tricks Frodo into kicking Sam out of the group, that signifies the dark inside of Frodo overpowering the light. People have called both Dina and Jesse poorly written characters, but I disagree because their dialogue is honestly pretty authentic. Rather, they're poorly chosen characters. If Dina and Jesse were replaced with characters better suited to generate conflict inside the party and influence Ellie's arc, it would have made the supporting cast so much more compelling. Jesse does none of these things, and Dina barely achieves one of them because she challenges Ellie at the, right at the very end of the story, but doesn't challenge her at any point before then. So, <sighs> the only purpose Dina's and Jesse's characters really serve is to be bouncing boards for Ellie to have dialogue with, so it isn't totally lonely. The problem is, a good supporting character does that, but they also do so much more. The first Last of Us didn't have this issue. Joel's and Ellie's relationship was full of conflict, and their personalities meshed really well as they constantly challenged each other. Uh, Tommy serves the role of helping Joel in his character arc as he enables Joel's temptation to abandon the quest by ditching Ellie on him and being rid of her, an option that Joel seriously considers. Uh, Marlene is the face of the Fireflies. Uh, she has a big effect on the plot as she gives Ellie to Joel in the first place and creates the inciting incident, and she's also there in the end, so again, she plays a role in the plot by telling Joel what they're doing to Ellie and so giving him the chance to rescue her. The roster of supporting characters in part 1 was pretty much perfect, but the roster in part 2 needs a total overhaul. And now with all of that out of the way, it's time to move on to part 3, a better story. So before you hear my rewrite, let's have a recap on all the issues that I'll be fixing. It's made for the wrong target audience, specifically tonal issues. A bad rising action, a poorly used midpoint, Abby's story lacks direction, there is no sense of urgency, largely pointless flashbacks, Ellie's and Joel's relationship is poorly explored, Abby and Ellie need more sympathetic motivations, Ellie has no arc, poor character verisimilitude, and finally the supporting cast doesn't work. Okay, uh, that, that list is extremely daunting now that I see it all written down. I might have put a little too much on my plate here, but I will do my best. Also, I might as well plug it here, but if you've been liking this video so far, please do support me on Patreon. Uh, if you support me there, you're helping me create more videos just like this and making my dream come true, because I can keep making these videos as my full-time job. And not to mention there's a ton of cool rewards like early access to all of my videos and a neat badge on my Discord server. There is a link to my Patreon in the description. Okay, so shameless plug over. On the rewrite, there's something I need to say. I tried really hard to find a way to fix all 11 issues while keeping this story intact. At the end of the day, if you just redo an entire story from the ground up, it stops being constructive criticism and it becomes more like fan fiction. But the ugly truth is, I've realised that it's impossible to fix all 11 issues and keep in line with the vision that Druckmann had for this story. Uh, the hang up is Joel. Uh, it's easy enough giving Abby a better plot and making her more sympathetic. Replacing the supporting cast is again fairly simple, giving the story a midpoint that actually works, all of that's fine. But if Joel dies at the start of the story, his relationship with Ellie can't be explored, and that's one of the main things that this game needed to do. But the issue is there's no way of having Joel not die, yet still have the same revenge story. 
So I'm making a hard choice. It's unfortunate, but it's also the only way. So in the middle of the game as is, we get a flashback to Ellie discovering the truth about what Joel did at the end of the first game. But I can't help but feel that this is a poorly placed flashback. So instead, let's rearrange this so this new game doesn't begin in Jackson, but in an abandoned St. Mary's hospital. And what happens here is largely identical to the flashback we got. Ellie goes through the hospital and finds proof of what really happened. Joel arrives the next morning, she confronts him with the evidence, and reluctantly, he says the truth. Making a vaccine would have killed you, so I stopped them. Then Ellie breaks down, and she cries out that he's a monster, that he murdered Marlene, and that she never wants to speak to him ever again. And as Ellie storms away, her relationship with Joel truly destroyed, we roll the opening titles. And then after the titles, we see St. Mary's Hospital again, but this time it says two years earlier. We see an unconscious Joel lying on a hospital bed, then Abby as she looks down at him. And this flashback is telling Abby's origin, and it's very similar to the one we got. We see Abby talking to her dad, then she finds his dead body as Joel killed him on his rampage. With this game, we aren't going to make the mistake of having one whole first half dedicated to one character, then the next half dedicated to the other. In this flashback, we set up that Abby knows who Joel is and what he looks like because she saw him while he was unconscious. And she knows who Ellie is, but but not what she looks like. Only her father, the other doctors, Marlene, and a handful of Firefly guards have ever seen Ellie because she was kept under a strict lockdown the second she arrived in the hospital. But in Joel's escape, he killed everyone who'd ever seen Ellie, uh, Marlene, her dad, the doctors, and the Firefly guards. As the story begins, Abby knows that in a town called Jackson, there's a girl called Ellie who's immune to the cordyceps, and she travels with Joel. While she doesn't know what Ellie looks like, she at least knows what Joel looks like. This will be important later. So now we play as Ellie in Jackson, and in the game we got, it betrays Ellie's and Joel's relationship after the first game as kind of rocky. You know, Ellie distrusts Joel and there's a little bit of friction between them. That's not good enough. In this new story, we show in the Jackson section that Ellie hates Joel, proper, fully-fledged, despises him more than anyone else in the world kind of hate. Uh, he enters the room and she leaves it. Everyone in the town knows that the worst thing you could possibly do, apart from take a hearty breath of spores, is to put Ellie and Joel in the same room. Uh, then we have that barn dance scene. In the game, that older guy has a go at Ellie for kissing Dina, but now we're changing it, so the person that does this is a guy called Kyle, and he is Dina's older brother. Dina's and Kyle's parents both died when Dina was a baby, so Kyle's looked after her ever since, and he is extremely protective over her, and Kyle hates Ellie. Like, he thinks she's vulgar, disrespectful, respectful and is completely unworthy of his sister. And her kissing Dina in this dance just sets him off, so he rips Ellie away from her and lays into Ellie about how she's just a trash human being who should find someone else to drag down to her level. Then Joel steps in and pushes Kyle away, telling him to leave her alone. But now Ellie just goes ballistic. In the scene we got, Ellie is a little annoyed at Joel here and tells him that she doesn't need his help. But in this story, she tears into him while the whole town watches. Uh, she says openly how much she despises him, how her life could have meant something, and he stole that from her. It's not possible for someone to tear another soul apart more than Ellie does to Joel here. And then, as Joel's heart breaks behind his eyes, he leaves without a word. Now finally we play as Abby, and this section of the game is identical to what we got with one change. She wakes up in the cabin, goes out with Owen to a ridge, and then they look down at Jackson. And Abby mentions what horror she plans to inflict on Joel, but Owen stresses, get your head straight. We didn't come here so you can settle a grudge. And we hear about Abby's evil plan, which adds a ton of suspense as we dread what she's going to do to him later on, but also we throw in a few hints that they have something far more in mind than simple revenge. Then there's a cutscene after the dance as Ellie and Dina have a private moment, and we sell the player on how much they love each other and how good a couple they make, and they're comparing scars like they do in the game. 
Ellie points at her wrist where she was bitten, where she masked it with a chemical burn and a tattoo. And judging by the way they speak, there's a clear subtext that Ellie told Dina the truth about her immunity a long time ago. So Dina knows all about the events of the first game. But then Dina looks incredibly insecure, and tells Ellie that many years ago, when she lived under Fedra in a military QZ, she had a girlfriend. But they had a pretty toxic relationship, so Dina broke it off. However, her ex went full psycho. The second Dina broke it off and then turned her back to leave her ex's apartment, she smashed a vase on Dina's head and knocked her out. And then Dina woke up to hear the military pounding on the door. And then she noticed a great bite-sized bloody child missing from her arm, and she'd lost a lot of blood. It took her a while to figure out what the hell happened, but it turns out this was all a scheme by her ex. Uh, she knew that if she just killed Dina outright, uh, she would have been found guilty of murder and been executed. But if she bit Dina, and then ran straight to the military, saying that a clicker had slipped through the city walls, and that was what bit Dina, and Dina then stumbled into her apartment afterwards begging for help, then the military would go in there guns blazing and kill Dina for her, and essentially she'd get away way with murder. It was a creative plan, but it didn't work out because Dina and her brother escaped the place and then made their way to Jackson. So the next morning, there's a patrol. Ellie heads out with Tommy, and Dina's with Joel. And each pair is given a sat phone, and it's said that the local tinkerer found these old phones in a radio shack, and he rigged them all up to communicate with a geostationary satellite in orbit above Mexico, one of the few that's left over from before the outbreak. And they say that using these special phones, they can instantly communicate anywhere from Canada to Venezuela, uh, not that they'd ever need to. So all the scouts don't use radios, rather these sat phones to talk to each other. So then, for a while we forget about Ellie as Joel is the player character and he patrols with Dina. And we establish that Dina's new to all of this, she's never been in a firefight and she's pretty naive to the ways of the world. After clearing some infected, Joel finds a toy dinosaur and asks Dina if she thinks Ellie would like it, but Dina says she's a grown woman, why would she want a toy? And then Joel just crumbles and buries his head to the floor. And the player really pities Joel because we see how much he loves Ellie and wants to have a relationship with her, and it's obvious that that will never happen. Uh, later, they find a dead infected, but the body hasn't frozen, it's still warm, and seeing as the last patrol came through over a day ago, that means there are other survivors in the area. Uh, Joel calls it in on his sat phone, saying that he needs backup and for everyone to go on alert. Adina insists that they'll be fine. The last 20 groups we came to Jackson were all nice enough people, but Joel insists that they want backup, uh, so Tommy replies saying that he and Ellie are on their way. Then Joel and Dina follow the tracks to find Abby's group in that lodge. Joel says they sit on their hands and wait for the next 10 minutes until Tommy gets here, and once they have more manpower, then they go speak to them and see what they want. But Dina's naive. Uh, she defies Joel and approaches Abby's group with a wide, friendly smile, and says she's from the settlement at the bottom of the valley, and she asks if they need anything. So they talk back and forth for a bit, and Abby says that her group's looking for a new place to call home, and she's wondering if Jackson would take them in. Uh, Dina says, it's not that easy. Like, first you have to build up trust, and then you go through this whole interview thing. We don't let just anyone in. And Abby asks, so how long does it usually take? Maybe a few months? Then Manny mumbles to Abby, that's too long. And Dina says, well I don't make the rules. But then she looks confused because Manny said that to Abby, not to Dina. Why would they say that's too long to each other? It's almost like they're planning something. And then the fear enters Dina's eyes, and she finally realises just how much she screwed up. And this tense conversation goes long as Dina tries to hide how terrified she is by forcing a smile and hiding her shaking hands behind her back. And she asks how they heard about Jackson in the first place, and Abby says, A girl told us about it a while back. You don't know someone called Ellie, do you? Dina freezes, she lights up with understanding, then bolts for the door. But they grab her, beat her, and rough her up for information. Joel calls in, he says exactly where he is, what's going on, and that he needs backup ASAP because Dina's about to die. And Tommy answers saying he's on his way. The justification we got in the game of them knowing that Abby came from Seattle because of her badge feels really quite contrived, so instead, while they're torturing Dina, she's keeping her mouth clamped shut, and Owen says something like, they'll know she's missing soon, then they'll send out a search party, we have to go back, the mission's blown. And then Manny says, y we go back to Seattle, you know what happens next, we can't go back empty handed. And then they bicker back and forth about whether they should abandon the mission, but then Owen says, hold on. We spotted how many patrols since yesterday? Three? So, says Abby. So every patrol was in a pair. These people don't travel alone. 
And then they realize that Dina must have a partner, someone who's probably in the balcony above, readying for the perfect opportunity to kill them. So then Abby puts a knife to Dina and shouts for her partner to show themselves or they'll gutter. And then with no other choice, Joel surrenders. But as he steps out with his hands raised, Abby locks eyes with him. And oh no, Abby recognises him instantly. So then they beat the hell out of the both of them and demand to know where Ellie is. And Joel glances at Dina because she's screaming as they hurt her. And then Abby looks at Dina, then gives a double take. As if she's come across a great revelation. Because she doesn't know what Ellie looks like, but she knows she's a girl who travels with Joel. A girl about Dina's age, and with a bite scar on her arm. Abby rolls up Dina's sleeves, and sure enough, we see the great ugly scar that she showed Ellie earlier. Yes, I know that this is a bit of a coincidence, but there are so many good stories out there which have coincidences as their inciting incident, and it's fine. I promise this will be the only coincidence in this entire story. Uh, so then, they demand to know Dina's name, and they torture her some more, and like a real bunch of assholes. But then Joel gives Dina a look, and Dina understands exactly what that look means. If you don't say what they want to, you're going to die. Then Dina gulps and says, Ellie. Then they cuff her and put a bag over her head. Abby turns back to Joel and she goes all Tiger Woods on his ass and like beats him within an inch of his life. Then she grabs a shotgun, ready to kill Joel, and it really looks like he's about to die. But instead, she calms her breathing, the rage leaves her face, and she says that she's better than him. But if she just lets him go, he'll only come after her. So Abby lowers her shotgun, then shoots his kneecap. Joel writhes around, groaning out a scream. He'll have a hard time chasing after Dina with only one working leg. So then they leave with Dina, and then Ellie finally arrives with Tommy, and after a bit of hesitation, she applies a tourniquet while Tommy goes out to chase after Abby. Joel passes out from blood loss, and everything fades to black. Joel wakes up, he's in a makeshift hospital bed, and his face is dark purple with the biggest bruise that you've ever seen. He grabs the railing and is about to haul himself up when he looks down, confused. Then he pushes the bedsheet away to see that his left leg is gone. And Joel's face drops as he realises that he'll never walk again. It's at this point that Ellie becomes the player character. Uh, Tommy says to her that he tried his best, but as he was finally closing in on them, they got in their van and drove away. There was no way he could chase after that on foot. And Tommy tells Ellie the bitter truth, that he can guess why they took Dina, because they falsely believe that she's Ellie. But the second they realise that Dina isn't Ellie, Dina's dead. And Tommy says that he wants nothing more than to rescue Dina, but he isn't an idiot. Not only do they have no idea where they went, but the second they scan her brain, they'll see that she's not immune, and that will be the end of her. And that'll happen long before any rescue party even finds out where she is. Dina is as good as dead. But Ellie is having none of it. She loves Dina with everything she has, so she gathers her gear and ready to set out on her own on this hopeless mission. And Tommy sighs and says... Fair enough. If Maria was the one who was taken, he'd already be out there. He'll give her one of the horses, but in return, Ellie has to take one of the sat phones and give him an update at the end of every day. Ellie agrees, but before she goes, she gives Joel one last visit, and it's the opposite of pleasant. Joel tells Ellie she overheard them mentioning that they'd come from Seattle. That gives Ellie her heading. And almost immediately, she goes to leave the room, and Joel blurts out that she saved his life. That has to mean that she cares about him at least slightly. And Ellie says that she doesn't want him to die. But that's about it. Uh, she's just here to make sure he's still breathing. Now uh, she's found that out, so now she'll be off. And the conversation is cold, harsh, and when Joel tries to get close to her and tell her how much she means to him, Ellie grows angry. And it ends bitterly with Ellie storming out, Joel reaching out to her, begging for her to stay, and her slamming the door in his face. And I know what you might be thinking, how are we going to explore Ellie's and Joel's relationship if he's bedridden the whole game? Well, you'll see soon enough. So Ellie mounts the horse and is a second away from leaving when someone runs up behind her. She turns to see Kyle, uh, Dina's older brother, and he says that he'll rescue Dina, then gut the people that did this. Even though Ellie and Kyle hate each other, seeing as Kyle's the only other person in Jackson willing to go out on this suicide mission, they set out together. And now we have a time change. We play as Abby one 
week in the past, long before this Jackson section even started, and everything is explained. We see her stadium, but it's more run down. In the game, the stadium is made to look like some kind of survivor paradise. Well, now the atmosphere is a lot more miserable. Uh, there are people starving, plants are wilting, and it's got this very oppressive feeling about it. Uh, she is going along doing her chores, when an alarm sounds, and then she looks up to see a fleet of helicopters fly low and fast up to the stadium. And it's like a gas attack in World War One as a siren wails, and everyone scrambles to find the nearest mask and put it on. The helicopters hover over the stadium with the word Fedra painted on the side in bright yellow, and there are great massive shipping containers dangling beneath each one. Uh, the containers drop one after the other into the middle of the stadium, and then the doors open to reveal that each one is jam-packed full with infected. And then these infected charge around and wreak havoc, biting and mutilating everyone in sight. And the player plays as Abby as she kills them all desperately to try and save her people. Uh, this whole section serves as a brutal introduction to Abby's world, and introduces the faction that's the bane of her existence, Fedra. But it's not the same Fedra that was in the original game, but we'll, we'll get to that later. So once Abby's killed the infected, she hears a woman sobbing, and Abby goes towards the noise to see someone crumpled on the ground, her palms over her eyes, crying like her life is about to end. And then Abby sees a great bite mark on the person's shoulder, and then she sees another person with a bite, stunned with shock, then another, then another, then dozens of people all bitten in this attack, and as Abby is overwhelmed trying to process the horror of this attack, someone screams that the wheat fields are on fire, Abby goes out and sees that smoke's coming from the crops outside the stadium, someone's burning down their food. They're being attacked from every angle all at once, and then Abby rushes out to douse the flames and save what food she can, all the while fighting back against the people who clearly aren't Fedra soldiers, rather they're Scars, an entirely different faction. And that's confusing, because why are the Scars working with Fedra? And, well... <laughs> I would really love to flesh everything out and to tell this story as if you're the player, where you start off confused, wondering what the hell was going on, but progressively you piece together more and more as Abby's plot goes along. But for the sake of time, let's summarise. Abby is part of the Fireflies, uh, they're still around, they haven't disbanded, and they hold control over the stadium in Seattle. However, they're at war with the local Fedra faction, Fedra being the remnants of the US military in this world. The thing is, up until about a year ago, the Fireflies Fireflies actually had Fedra on the run in this city. They and the many other factions in the Seattle area, such as the Scars and the Rattlers and all of these other unique factions we'll see later on, were successfully beating Fedra in this war for control over Seattle. But then, Fedra created the cure the cure to the cordyceps. But it's not a vaccine, now, that's an important difference. It works more like antibiotics. Uh, when someone's infected, uh, they'll take a dose of the stuff and it wipes out the cordyceps in that person's system. It cures them, but it's a one-time thing. Like If you take antibiotics, your body doesn't suddenly become immune to all bacteria for the rest of time. Uh, the same with this. Uh, for every time you get bitten, you need to take another dose. So in order to stay immune, you need a constant supply. And here's the thing, fed has total control over its supply. And they've used this cure as a power play by saying to all of the factions in the area that in return for having a steady supply of the cure, they had to submit to Fedra's rule, effectively becoming puppets. And the offer of having a cure to the infection was so tempting that every single local faction capitulated and became subservient to Fedra, all except for the Fireflies. And why are the Fireflies holding out? Because here's the thing, Fedra essentially is a military dictatorship. They're led by a man we'll call General Redgrave, uh, someone who before the infection was actually a general in the US Army and served in Iraq. What's really terrifying about this guy is he doesn't give monologues, he doesn't have an ego, he won't order people tortured just for the fun, he is purely tactical, logical, and is a ruthlessly brilliant commander. Like, he was crushing insurgencies in the Middle East long before the outbreak started, and he's remembered all of his dirty tricks for crushing them. He is bringing back law and order to a world ruled by anarchy, and he's doing it by being a true dictator. You do exactly what he says, or you get shot. You so much as steal a loaf of bread, 
you get shot. If you publicly criticise him, you get shot. And the Fireflies, quite understandably, would rather not have this guy be their leader, thank you very much. And that's why Fedra was dropping infected into their stadium and getting the other factions to burn their crop fields, because it's all a part of a combined effort to weaken the last holdout faction in the area and force them to surrender. That's why Abby and her crew went to Jackson, because if they can use Ellie to find a way to create a permanent cure, like one where you take a single shot and that's it, you're immune from the Cordyceps forever, it will break General Redgrave's grip and all the other local factions as his cure, which is what's giving him all of his influence, will suddenly be worthless. Doesn't this version of Abby sound so much more compelling as a character compared to the one we got? Like, she does evil things, she hurts people, she tortures people, but it's all in the name of protecting her people, creating a cure and taking down this tyrannical military that's oppressing her people. All of a sudden, she has a noble goal, and she's a far more engaging protagonist for it. If you ask me, that's how you do an unlikable protagonist. So with Ellie, she's out on the road at night and calls up Tommy, saying that she's about a day out from Seattle, and it's a pretty short, inconsequential talk where he gives her a little bit of advice but nothing more. Then the next day comes, and they find the van that Abby escaped in, and it's riddled with bullet holes. And this whole section plays like a mystery, because clearly they were ambushed and a firefight went down. So Ellie and Kyle look for clues on where they went next, and then they see that Dina's jacket is on a pole out in the open. It seems that Dina's leaving behind a breadcrumb trail for someone to follow. Ellie's convinced that Dina's leaving behind these clues for her, but Kyle scoffs because she's clearly leaving them behind for him. He's always been the one who protected her, ever since she was a baby. She knows to expect that he'll come out to save her. Also, Dina's just too clever to believe that some trailer trashed like Ellie would care about Dina's safety, let alone have the decency to come out and save her. And as you can guess, this doesn't go down too well with Ellie. Uh, we reinforce how much they hate each other's guts in this bit. She gives Kyle a boost over a ledge, but then he doesn't lift her up and says that she'll have to find her own way round. Ellie sees a badass looking gun and we get the player really excited about getting this and playing with it and they have to do a puzzle to access it and then once the player completes the puzzle and goes to claim it, Kyle beats them to it and then he claims it for himself and this really pisses the player off and also they constantly bicker about who should be the one who rides the horse. All of a sudden Kyle is a far more compelling supporting character than Dina or Jesse ever were, even if he's an absolute twat. And during this period, Kyle understandably asks why they kidnapped Dina in the first place, and Ellie explains to Kyle that she's immune. Dina's identity was mistaken, and that's why. And naturally this is a nice tense scene where he accuses her of being responsible for Dina being kidnapped, and for once, Ellie agrees with him, and showing how guilty she feels that she's pushed Dina into this horrible situation. And during this section, Ellie and Kyle stumble across some of the local factions under Fedra's thumb, and also they both discover that this cure exists. So at the end of the first day in Seattle, Ellie slumps down exhausted and opens up her sat phone. She calls home, sighs and says, Tommy, are you there? And then a voice talks back. Hey kiddo, it's Joel. And Ellie's confused, angry, she, she asks what the hell he's doing, where's Tommy? And Joel explains that Tommy's fine, but Joel can't walk anymore, in fact he can't do much of anything anymore. But he can still talk, so now he's in charge of communications. He's taken Tommy's job of organising all the scouting missions, and Ellie will be talking to him from now on, not Tommy. And Ellie is the opposite of happy, like their conversation is harsh, angry and it ends with Ellie hanging up while Joel's still talking. She's unable to stand the idea of speaking to the man who ruined her life. And now the flashbacks with Abby are over, now we are in the present day with Abby and telling our stories truly in parallel and doing away with the whole multiple timeline issue because it's not really necessary for this story. Um, Abby's speaking to Dina and she has just a hint of doubt that Dina is who she says she is. This plays out for a while until we have this conversation where Abby brings up Marlene and asks if Dina ever met Marlene's son. No, no I, I don't think so, says Dina. Are you sure? Her and Adam were inseparable, like you never saw one without the other. Dina slowly nods, R right, no I, I do remember him, yeah. And Abby's face almost imperceptibly twitches, and all of the forced joy on her face succumbs to the snarl a dog gives a rat. There's a long pause and Abby says, Marlene never had any kids. And as Abby builds up with rage and looks like she's about to strangle Dina to death, finally realising that she is an Ellie, Abby breaks. 
She falls to the floor, overwhelmed by grief and sobs. She's got the wrong person. Her missions failed. By the time she got back to Jackson, found a way to lure Ellie out of the safety behind its walls, then kidnapped her and then came back, her people were already given in to Fedra. It's all over, and Abby loses all hope that she might ever save her people. In the game we got, there was a moment in a flashback where I had a great big smile on my face because it felt like a really nice Chekhov's gun that they'd introduced, and I was really excited to see it fired, but it never was. I think it's a crime that happened, so let's fire it here. When Ellie's having a flashback with Joel, this happens. Put your mask on. Ugh, do I have to? It's just us. What if we run into someone? You gotta be smart about this. You start wearing that mask, kiddo, and eventually you're going to slip up in front of someone you shouldn't. I've never slipped. So now let's have a nice payoff for that. Ellie's hot on Abby's heels, but then Abby slips into a spore nest. Uh, Kyle puts on his mask, but Ellie didn't bother to bring one herself because she never needs one. Like Kyle has a go at Ellie, saying how can she breathe in this stuff? And she bats it off, saying that she does it all the time, she'll be fine. But then, after a bit of action, as they chase down Abby, Kyle and Ellie stumble right in front of Abby and her crew, and Abby sees clear as day Ellie walking through a spore nest with no mask on at all, and Abby's eyes eyes burst wide with shock, then scowl with understanding. That's the real Ellie. That's the girl she's been looking for all along. Oh crap. But sure enough, Abby and her crew lose Ellie and Kyle. Now we're about a quarter of the way through the story, and it's time to have a nice turning point. The story is no longer about Ellie hunting Abby, it's about Abby hunting Ellie, and Ellie trying to survive as the fireflies chase after her. And even worse, she has Dina as a hostage, someone who clearly Ellie loves, otherwise she wouldn't have come out this far to save her. And this whole cat and mouse section goes on for a while, until it ends in a standoff in another spore nest. Um, Ellie and Kyle have their guns aimed at Abby. Abby, who has Dina as a hostage and a gun, to her head. One thing that I thought The Last of Us 2 didn't do very well is it portrayed Ellie as a total cynic, and it just feels a little bit inconsistent with the Ellie that we saw in the first game. Well, in this exchange, Ellie still has that fierce optimism to her. There's a tense back and forth, and Ellie insists that if she lets go of Dina and surrenders, they'll let Abby go free. They'll forgive what she's done and let her go. No one else has to die today. And Kyle says, fuck that, I'll kill you. And his anger just ruins Ellie's efforts to defuse the situation. But then Abby has the most creative and terrible thought. She grabs Dina's mask and rips it off. Dina breathes in lungfuls of spores and coughs madly. They both scream no and charge forward, but Abby presses the gun back to Dina's head and they stop. She says only the cure can save her now. And it just so happens that Fedra keeps every last vial under strict control, meaning Dina will never get a dose from them. But the Firefly stole a case of the stuff. It's the only sample of the cure in the whole city not under Fedra's thumb. The only way for Dina to survive now is if she comes back to the Firefly Stadium and is given the cure there. Otherwise, she'll be a runner by tomorrow evening. And Abby plays their love for Dina like a fiddle and gets them to lower their guns, surrender, and go with Abby back to the stadium. On the way there, Ellie corners Abby and puts a knife to her throat, and Abby says, go ahead, you kill me and your girlfriend never gets the cure. You kill me, you kill her. So they trek back to the stadium with a massive amount of conflict between the four of them. And on the way there, Eddie stops to see a worn, weathered poster for a dinosaur exhibit in a museum. And as Ellie stares at it, lost in thought, we have a flashback to Ellie and Joel years ago, just after the first game, back when they loved each other. And that flashback we got in the actual game, where Ellie and Joel go to that museum and get in that space capsule, we have that here, exactly the same as it is in the game. We see how much they enjoyed each other other's company, but as the flashback comes to a close, it ends with the younger Ellie smiling at the dinosaur statue, and then it fades in a transition from the statue's outline to the worn, tattered posters outline of the dinosaur, and Ellie looks at it with longing in her eyes, and we see how much Ellie misses those days, how nostalgic she is for them, just like the player is. In this story, that flashback does more than just act as a moment of levity in a dark story, it reminds the player exactly what Ellie used to have, and it tells us exactly what's going on inside her head, that secretly, deep down, Ellie misses her days with Joel, and she yearns to have those days back again. 
That's how you do a flashback. Not by having it be a nice thing on its own, but by having it weave into the overall story and assist in the plot and the character's journey. Also, as they go along, Kyle's warming up to Ellie. Uh, he starts laughing at her terrible puns, and in terms of gameplay, he's no longer a liability as he helps Ellie out. Then that gun that he grabbed before Ellie could, well, now he gives it to her, saying that she's a better shot than him anyway. And we see that Kyle's beginning to respect Ellie just a little bit, and he confesses that maybe Ellie isn't totally unworthy of his sister after all. We give Kyle a nice little redemption arc where he stops being Ellie's enemy, and he becomes more of a friend. So then they reach the stadium, and Abby locks Dina in a cell. She says that she has the cure, but she's not giving it to Dina. Not yet. Ellie has to go with Abby to the hospital that's controlled by Fedra. In there, the lead doctor's a Firefly sympathizer, and they want to help make a permanent cure cure to take down Fedra. Ellie says, you want me to let you kill me? And Abby says that her father was the Firefly doctor that was going to do surgery on Ellie before, but he was a heart surgeon before the outbreak. He was a good doctor, but he knew very little about brain surgery, and next to nothing on pandemics. But the guy in this hospital used to work for the CDC before. He was one of the world's foremost experts on fungal infections. In fact, this is the guy who created the cure that Fedra has been using. If anyone in the world could find a way to reverse engineer what's inside of Ellie and not kill her in the process, it would be him. There is hope. There's a way for Ellie to get what she wants and have her quiet life with Dina, and also a way for Abby to get her cure and take down Fedra. This is the moment of great hope, as it seems everyone can win. But Ellie says by the time they get back from wherever it is they're going, Dina would turn. She'll die. Give her the cure now. Then Ellie will go with her. And Abby looks confused. She says, what? You heard me, says Ellie. And then Abby finally understands. You don't know, do you? And then Abby gives a rather gruesome revelation. If you give a runner or a clicker the cure, it works. It kills the fungus and the infection leaves them, and they return to the person they used to be. But this means that when you get infected, you don't actually die, and the accounts of the people who survived it are haunting, because they all claim that they were awake for every second of it. They say that the cordyceps stole control over their motor functions, but it left their brain intact. Even clickers, even bloaters who have been infected for over a decade, still have the person they used to be locked inside of them, in permanent pain, as the fungus sprouts and irritates every nerve ending in their body. Unable to move their arms and legs because the infection did that for them. Nothing more than a spectator in their body. Now that is purely my addition, but I think it would have been a bloody brilliant revelation. It would have made the idea of being infected so much more terrifying, and I think it would have been a lovely reveal. Anyway, Abby says that Dina will be fine. Like, even if she becomes a runner, she won't die. She could be left for years and become a clicker, and the cure would still turn her back at that stage. So Kyle gets locked in a cage next to Dina, and Ellie and Abby set out together to this Fedra hospital. And now, Ellie opens up her sat phone to speak to Joel, and she cracks. Finally, the stress and the strain on her is just too much to stand, and she tells Joel everything, that she's been blackmailed, that Dean has been infected, and Ellie's never felt more alone and afraid in all her life. And Joel consoles her without skipping a beat, telling her what to do, to not trust Abby, because people like her always go back on their word, to remember all the lessons he taught her, and to leave these people and their politics alone, and come home with Dina the first second she can. And Ellie finally asks, after all this time, she finally asks how he's doing, and if he's feeling better and Joel says that the local tinkerer made him a prosthetic leg. It's uncomfortable, damn near impossible to walk with, and it's unbelievably painful, but he's been practicing with it. Now in this part of the game, Ellie and Abby are having a lot of tense conversations as they begrudgingly work together, and Abby explains her side of the story, that her people are desperate, that if they can find a permanent cure, they'll weaken Fendra and kill the golden goose that is their cure. It'll be the key to saving her people, and Abby tries really hard to convince Ellie to join her side, but Ellie doesn't care. She only wants to keep Dina safe and nothing more. 
They reach this hospital, and it's a house of horrors. It's slowly unraveled bit by bit that this isn't actually a hospital. It's just called that because before the outbreak it was one, and it has the words General Hospital above the entrance. It turns out that Fedra's repurposed it for research and development on the Cordyceps. They're weaponizing it. And some of the lawbreakers and fireflies they capture, they aren't shooting them. They're dragging them here, to this nightmarish place where they're intentionally infecting them with new strength strains of the cordyceps, a strains that make them more docile, or more aggressive, strains that mean the infection is asymptomatic until they fully turn. Meaning they can infect someone, release them into an enemy camp, and there won't be any signs they're infected until they suddenly turn and start biting everyone in sight. It's like a Trojan horse. And in case you haven't figured it out yet, I find body horror morbidly fascinating. Uh, so I love the idea, I, I really think this is cool, that Ellie comes into a room and she finds an ex-clicker tied to a chair, someone who's been brought back from being infected, and she doesn't have a face. No eyes, no nose, just a great big gash where a face should be. But Ellie stumbles back in shock as she notices this thing. She knocks over something and the woman's ears perk up. This is what a cured infected looks like, and it's beyond horrific. Ellie has a brief talk with this poor woman, and she nods with what Ellie says, so clearly she can still hear. And Ellie says that her friend's infected, as she needs to find the cure so she can help her. Where can she find it? And the woman shakes her hand around with her fingers pinched. Ellie gets the message. She wants to write the location of the cure down. So Ellie grabs a pen and paper, gives it to the woman, she scribbles something down, and Ellie looks at the paper to see the words, kill me. God, I am so messed up as a human being, like I am not right in the head, but that would be bloody horrendous and bloody lovely at the same time. Like, not just because a bit of body horror is always nice, but because it adds a real sense of urgency here. This is what will happen to Dina if Ellie doesn't get the cure fast. And then after the cutscene ends, the player is given the option of whether they want to grant this poor woman her request. So Ellie and Abby split up, and Ellie stumbles across General Redgrave's office, and she sees his battle plans for the future and we see that this guy knows exactly what he's doing, and he's very organised. But here, Ellie learns about what his master plan is. He wants to take control of the Seattle area, and then once he has a firm foothold, he'll build and train a proper army. And then using it, he'll expand his reach and retake America, all by the means of ruling like a tyrant and killing anyone who gets in his way. They either surrender to him and join his faction, or they die. Ellie realises that this is a war that she can't ignore, because if this guy is allowed to grow his influence unchecked, it's only a matter of time until he reaches Jackson and destroys her home. And now Ellie finally agrees with Abby. Like, she still hates the bitch, but Ellie understands where she's coming from, and she agrees that a permanent cure needs to be found, because that's the only way of ruining this guy's plans. But then, as Ellie's going around the room and finding all these clues, the door opens, and in walks General Redgrave. They both stare at each other, surprised. Then he scowls and slams the door shut before she can get a shot off. She runs up to the door and tries to bust it down, but she can't. He's tipped a vending machine over on the other side, and the door to his office only opens one way, as she tries to scramble through a window, but it's just too narrow, and she realises that there is no way way out. She's trapped. So Ellie does the only thing that she can do. She gets out her sat phone and calls Joel, and explains that she's about to die. That this general's insane and he's planning to invade the entire country. And Joel gets erratic and tells her she needs to run. Uh, then sure enough, soldiers come and throw tear gas into the room and gas Ellie out. Ellie scrambles to grab her gas mask, but she can't find it. Because that's right, she doesn't bring a gas mask because she never needs one. If only she'd listened to Joel's advice. They subdue her, and as Joel screams Ellie's name through the phone, one of the soldiers comes along and stomps on it, breaking the thing into little pieces. So now, as Ellie's hung up in a prison alongside some captured fireflies, the general comes along and she tries to goad him, but he blanks her, not stooping to the level of replying to her insults. With cold passionlessness, he interrogates them all and figures out that they're all fireflies, all except for Ellie, who is an outsider. He says that that sat phone she was using was too advanced for someone just roaming the country. We see that he's really quite perceptive because he accuses her of being part of a larger group outside of Seattle, and he demands to know where 
where they're based. And now Ellie gets tortured for information, and this goes on for two whole days. We get the player to just hate this Fedra faction, as Ellie is deprived of sleep, and not so nice things are done to her as they wear down her willpower and press her for information. Eventually, Abby comes to Ellie's rescue, and they reach this doctor who's trying to make a cure. After they have a chat and scan her brain, Ellie is told that Abby's father was right. The whole infection in her brain needs to be removed in order to create a vaccine. There truly is no way to create a permanent cure without killing Ellie. And this puts Ellie in an impossible position, because does she sacrifice her life for the greater good, or does she act selfishly and save herself? Funnily enough, for all her hatred of Joel, she never once actually thought what she'd do if the choice were hers, and maybe that was because deep down she was afraid of the answer that she might pick. And the Doctor starts to ramble away, saying that the Fireflies have had to execute their own once they've gotten infected, but Ellie will put a stop to that, she will save so many lives, it's a very heroic thing that Ellie's doing. But then Ellie finally asks a good question. If the Fireflies had a shipment of the cure, why would they put Ellie aside and not use it for treating their own people? And Abby stutters, giving a thoroughly weak and uncompelling answer about how they need it for research. Then there's a tense silence. Then Ellie reaches for a gun, but Abby grabs her and chokes Ellie out with her superior strength. As a team effort, Abby cuffs Ellie to a radiator while the Doctor injects her with anaesthetic. And then they step back while Ellie writhes around around, the tranquilizer slowly taking effect. Ellie screams out how Abby betrayed her, and Abby says, you're right, if I had the cure, I'd use it on my people, not yours. And Ellie begs, saying please, please save Dina, and Abby, not wanting to tell a lie, says, you'll both be together soon. And with the drug muddying her thoughts, it takes Ellie a while to figure out what Abby's trying to say, but when she does, she screams, angry, heartbroken, grieving, all of these things coming out in one gut-wrenching noise. And while this is going on, we do parallel cuts as while this cutscene is playing out, we cut back to Dina and Kyle in their cells, and Dina looks incredibly sick. Then she twitches, and then we see the horror on Kyle's face as she starts throthing at the mouth, gives a devolved scream, and clambers to grab Kyle through the bars, her face inhuman and savage. We really go all in to make the player depressed here. Everything is looking downhill. Ellie's about to die, Dina's turned, and she's about to die along with Kyle. There truly is no more hope. And then we play as Abby as she travels back to her stadium and regroups with a squad of fireflies. The doctor's about to vivisect Ellie and reverse engineer a vaccine. She hears news from this group of fireflies that they've retaken a portion of the city that they thought they'd never be able to retake. Apparently last night, a firefly scout went through to find the entire group of scars who were holding the area just dead. And then the fireflies walked in to claim the place without any resistance. Although, funnily enough, they had no idea who attacked them because there weren't any infected or any bodies from any other faction there. Oh, that's curious. But anyway, this is good news for the Fireflies, and they walk along when out of nowhere one of their heads just explodes, and a gunshot sounds like rolling thunder. And we have that whole sniper section as Abby's squad gets picked off one by one, and it plays out like it does in the game. Abby crawls through these tight spots, spends ages chasing this sniper down, then charges through the door, and we reveal that the sniper is Joel, and they fight for the gun. Joel and Abby lock eyes, and they recognise each other, and they duke it out as they bite each other, and they try to gouge each other's eyes out, and it's this desperate, dirty fight. And during this, we see that Joel now has a prosthetic leg, the one he mentioned in his call with Ellie, but obviously this puts him at a massive disadvantage because his footwork is really shoddy. This is experimental, I'm not sure if a game's ever done this before, but I think it could honestly work quite well here. As they fight, Abby gets the upper hand, and she gets closer and closer to killing Joel, and when he's on his back having his ass kicked, the camera stops being over Abby's shoulder, and it turns to be over Joel's shoulder, and in a seamless transition, Joel becomes the player character. I've never seen a game do this in the middle of a fight before, but I think it could honestly work really well. And after this intense fight, Joel, by the skin of his teeth, grapples Abby and throws her through the railing and into the water. And now, we finally reach the midpoint of the story. And the thing is, 
Abby dropped her backpack, so now Joel picks it up and he inherits her supplies. So the player doesn't have to start from scratch like they did when they had to switch to Abby, as every gun the players picked up as Abby and every upgrade they've made with her, it all transfers to Joel, as he now has all of her gear. Not to mention all of the guns he did in the first game, like the El Diablo revolver and all of that as a nostalgia trip. And now we have a flashback to Joel's perspective in Jackson, three days earlier when Ellie called him up. And we see the pure horror in his face as Ellie screams and the phone cuts off into a drone. And this flashback explains that Joel immediately grabbed his gear and stumbled through the snow, then fell flat on his face and found it insanely difficult to walk on his new leg. And he falls over again and bashes his head, but he grits his teeth and forces himself to get up each and every time, pure determination on his face. Then he gets on a horse and races to Seattle. So now Joel's the player character and he makes his way to the hospital because Ellie said that earlier that was where she was in the call. Climbing is slow and difficult and he runs with a limp and is in constant pain. On his way to the hospital he sees Fedra soldiers moving a shipping container with a crane. Then a tremendous, terrifying roar comes from inside as the container thrashes around. Joel mumbles, what the hell is that? And the guards around it say that at least they finally found a use for all of those captured fireflies. And another one says that last week one of the new recruits saw this thing in its cage and she's woken up screaming every night since. So Joel bats it off, goes to the hospital, rescues Ellie and kills the doctor without any hesitation, echoing the first game, showing how deep down Joel hasn't changed one bit and he's still the exact same guy. And this is when the rising action of the story is really ramping up, because we overhear the Fedra soldiers saying that the next morning they're launching a massive assault on the stadium. Every last faction in the city and every Fedra soldier will all take part. It'll be the single largest operation that they've ever done, and they plan to take out every firefly they find, leaving no survivors. Ellie eventually comes to and Joel tells her this, and Ellie says that Dina and Kyle are there, they'll be stuck in the middle of that whole attack. They have to go save them. So Joel and Ellie grab three vials of the cure for Dina because that's all they can find and they make their way there. And here this is full on nostalgia because it's just like the first game as Ellie and Joel are a pair again. They're travelling on Joel's horse and making the way through the ruined city, but it's not the same. That banter they had before, that father-daughter dynamic, it's gone. Joel asks her questions, tries to get her to talk, and she never gives off more than a hum or a one-word answer. Their relationship is clear on display, and it's a shadow of what it used to be. Ellie explains to Joel that Abby plans to kill Dina and Kyle, so Joel comes up with a plan. They'll find a way to send a message to the Fireflies. If they can tell them that Ellie is free, they won't kill Dina and Kyle because they'll lose their leverage. But here we have a really tense moment as Abby makes her way towards the stadium and says to the guards at the front gates that it's time to execute the two prisoners. She doesn't need them anymore. Then we play as either Ellie or Joel are going to a Firefly outpost and massacring their way through. Then Ellie uses the radio, sends her message out, and stops Abby from killing her friends just in the nick of time. And then she gets Abby on the other line and they talk. Ellie goes all Liam Neeson on her ass and gives a creatively worded, terrifying threat about how Abby is as good as dead. All the while, Joel holds Ellie's shoulders to console her, and Ellie doesn't shake him away. So after that, they get away from the outpost and they have a talk. And all of Ellie's angst, Joel's choice in the last game, it all gets openly discussed. Ellie says that Joel stole her life, then murdered Marlene. But Joel counters back, saying something like, what Fedra is doing, using the cure to manipulate these people. It's exactly what the Fireflies would be doing if I didn't stop them. If I'd let them have their way, it would have played out the exact same, just the other way around. And Ellie looks at the floor. But that's not why you did it. Doesn't change the fact it's true. Shut the fuck up, Joel, she cries. Who are you trying to convince? Because we both know that you never gave a shit about the Fireflies. Or Fedra. No. So why? And there's a long, long pause and pain enters Joel's eyes. Do I really need to tell you that? And after hashing it out some more, Ellie says, Back in the Firefly Hospital, I understand why you did it. I, I can't forgive you, 
but I understand. But just because you care about me, that doesn't make me your property. Just leave me alone from now on. Ellie, swear to me. Swear to me that you'll treat me like an actual adult, not some kid that can't make decisions for herself. And Joel gives her a long, hard look. I swear. And they look at each other for a long time. Their looks soften. There's an awkward hesitation in the air as it looks like they're considering going for a hug, but they don't and then they move on. So now Ellie and Joel are making their way towards the stadium, and they're talking, and Ellie makes her terrible puns, and Joel chuckles back, and it's just like the first game, they're having banter, and they're back to being the iconic duo as their relationships visibly improved. But as they make their way towards the stadium, helicopters fly overhead, and then the streets become packed with a war party heading in the same direction that they are. The assault on the stadium is about to begin. So now the climax, the final battle is underway as they have a three-way fight between Fedra, their goons, versus the Fireflies, versus Joel and Ellie as they slip into the stadium. At some point, Ellie and Joel are separated in the chaos with Ellie on the inside and Joel in the stands. A helicopter flies over, then lowers down a great big cargo container, the very same one that Joel saw earlier in the hospital thrashing around. The doors open and out comes a monster, an abomination, the Rat King. In this, it didn't congeal in some basement, but it was a byproduct of Fedra's unbelievably inhumane experiments with the Cordyceps. And this thing tears through every firefly there, and Joel has a great big boss battle as he fights to kill this terrifying thing. Uh, then we play as Ellie. She finds Kyle and Dina exactly where they were, but her heart stops as she sees that Dina's turned. Nonetheless, she frees Kyle. Ellie sees that each vial contains two doses of the cure. So, with a bit of teamwork, they inject Dina with half of one of the vials. They step back, but before they can see the effect kick in, Abby comes in and knocks out Kyle, causing that cure vial to smash on the floor. And Ellie and Abby have a great big fight with Ellie as the player character. Like, lol, imagine if the game made you play as Abby when we actually like Ellie as a character more. Like, imagine if they did that. Oh, I'm glad that didn't happen. And Ellie does her best, but Abby gets the upper hand. She starts pummeling Ellie. With every punch, Ellie's life flashes before her eyes. She sees Riley from the first game's DLC, then Joel playing his guitar, then Dina. And just as Ellie's about to succumb to the darkness, Abby stops, handcuffs her, and is about to drag Ellie away as her prisoner when Kyle comes in and attacks attacks Abby, saying leave her alone, and Kyle's arc comes full circle as he started the game hating Ellie's guts, but now he's trying to save her life. Ellie watches helplessly as her hands are cuffed behind her back, and the two of them fight. Abby gets the upper hand, then stabs Kyle in the neck. Ellie screams, and Kyle drops to the ground, stone dead. Ellie, tears in her eyes, runs away and hides with her hand still tied behind her back. And this whole section of the game plays like alien isolation for a bit, as Ellie's totally defenseless and trying to find somewhere to hide. But sure enough, Abby finds her and drags her away again, about to make off with her in this truly miserable all hope is lost moment, when Joel finally arrives and scares Abby off, forcing her to retreat. Joel frees Ellie, they go back to Dina's cell and see that she's nothing more than a shivering wreck in the fetal position on the floor. Ellie goes up to her, and Dina looks up to reveal her quite sane eyes. The three of them escape the stadium and make it somewhere safe. Uh, Ellie's concussed and exhausted, but seeing as there are two vials of the cure left, and she doesn't need them herself for obvious reasons, she gives one to Joel and one to Dina. Uh, they both pocket them, and then she collapses, too exhausted to keep her eyes open anymore. So now things are calm. The battle is over. Ellie's unconscious on a table with Dina caressing her head, but Joel standing over them both, and he has the most terrible idea. He looks down at the vial of the cure in his hands, and Dina asks what he's doing, and Joel says that first there was the Firefly Doctor, then there was the Fedra one. It's only a matter of time until someone else comes along, another doctor, another faction, looking to create a vaccine. One day, maybe in a month, maybe in five years, Ellie will have to choose if she wants to die to create a vaccine. Dina's confused, and Joel says, but she doesn't have to. There's another way. He looks down again at the cure in his hands. 
there's a benign cordyceps infection in her brain. That's what makes her immune. Best I can tell, this thing wipes out all cordyceps inside someone. So, if I give her the cure, she won't be immune, says Dina, finally understanding. Joel looks down at the vial, then clamps his eyes shut, a look of pure shame on his face. Then we do a hard cut to later. Ellie wakes up and Dina's by her side. Dina says that Joel's out on the roof keeping a lookout, and he's been saying that once Ellie's better, the three of them should hunt down Abby and get revenge for Kyle. They both mourn Kyle, but Ellie's head throbs and the screen pulses purple. Ellie has the most horrible headache, worse than any hangover. Then Dina lowers her voice and says she had it doubly as bad when she had the cure. Ellie looks at her and Dina says the truth, that Joel injected Ellie Ellie with a cure while she was out, to take the choice away from her to save her life in the future, and that Joel threatened Dina to keep it a secret after the fact, but she couldn't keep it a secret from Ellie or she might walk into a spore nest without a mask again, not knowing any better. So then Ellie stumbles up to the roof to speak to Joel. He's visibly relieved to see her and gives a wide smile and asks how she's holding up. But she lays into him, saying how she trusted him, that he promised to change, and Joel is beyond confused. Then Ellie accuses him of injecting her with the cure, and now he gets even more confused. He says he meant that promise, he'd never break it, y you know I'd never lie to you. And Ellie says, right, because you've never done that before. And Ellie is heartbroken as she says it, they're done that they just are. She was making so much progress in learning to trust him again, and he just had to ruin it by going behind her back. Ellie says, go kill Abby, do what you want, go die for all I care, but if you survive, never come near Jackson. And Ellie implies that if she ever sees Joel again, she'll probably kill him and then she runs off at a speed that Joel can't hope to match because of his bad leg, and she takes Joel's horse and rides away with Dina, abandoning Joel in the middle of the city. So now, with nothing left to do, with nothing left to live for, Joel goes after Abby on a mission of revenge. I, I didn't entirely abandon the revenge plot, we still do get a little bit of revenge plot here, and we have this epilogue section where he's tracking Abby down and we see the aftermath of the climax with all the dead fireflies. Um, but just before Joel engages Abby in the final fight, we have a cutscene of Ellie and Dina making their way back to Jackson, and Dina's consoling Ellie, hugging her from behind on the horse, whispering words of sweet comfort, but saying that she should have known better, she should have seen it coming, a leopard never changes its spots, and Ellie agrees she was an idiot to trust Joel a second time, and the heartbreak is clear in Ellie's voice. But as they go along, they come across a man who's been bitten and left for dead by his friends. He begs for them to shoot him and end it quickly, but Ellie says that she can do one better than that. She turns to Dina and asks her to get her cure out to help this poor guy. But Dina says she'd rather save it, uh, someone in Jackson might need it after all, and Ellie's baffled. She says again to get it out, and Dina says no, and they get into a really heated, confusing argument. Ellie overpowers Dina, steals her backpack, and sifts through it to see the cure vial that she gave Dina. And it's half empty. Ellie asks, when did you have a chance to use this? And Dina stumbles over her answer, saying that she accidentally spilt it when she was going through her gear. And Ellie freezes. Her face drops. She finally realises that it was Dina who used the cure on her, and she pinned it on Joel, knowing that she'd buy it hook, line and sinker because of his track record. Joel was the perfect scapegoat. Ellie realises that Joel kept his promise. Joel had in fact changed for the better because she asked him to, and in return, she basically told him to go kill himself. So Ellie takes the horse, leaves Dina, and charges back to Seattle. So now we have the final fight between Joel and Abby, a rematch of their first encounter in that sniper section. It's brutal, horrific, there's eye gouging and biting and scratching, and it's just the most ghastly fight. Abby finds a gun, flails it around wildly and shoots at Joel. Uh, Joel rips it out of her hands, then gets on top of her and begins drowning her in the ocean. After a while of her kicking and fighting back, she stills. Abby is well and truly dead. But then, Joel looks down 
and he sees blood in the water. Uh, he's confused for a bit. He looks down to see two bullet holes in his gut. During the fight, Joel was so worked up on adrenaline that he didn't even notice that he'd been shot twice by Abby. He stumbles towards the shore, trying to hold the blood in with his hands, then collapses against a rock. At first, he's panicking to try and stop the bleeding, but then he realises that the damage is just too great. Joel gives up, flops his hand to the sand, and stares off at the sunset. And just as his eyes begin to drift away, a horse charges down the beach with Ellie on top. Ellie runs towards him and immediately tries to stop the bleeding, begging for him to hold on. She says it was Dina who did it, and she begs for his forgiveness. Joel forgives her instantly, and he makes her promise to be strong, to look after the people at Jackson, because he can't anymore. He tells her to remember all of the lessons that he taught her, and she promises to. That's my girl. He says weakly, and as his eyelids shut, Ellie, tears welling in her eyes, cries out, Dad! But it's too late for him to hear. Joel's hand falls to his side, his body still as a rock. Ellie buries her head into his chest, wailing as she mourns for him. So we skip time. Ellie's dug a grave for Joel, and she says some final words. She places something on the soil and lays her hand on it tenderly, her hand stopping us from seeing what it is. Ellie walks off towards her horse, and the camera pans down to show Joel's old watch beneath the cross, the one his daughter gave to him at the very start. We see Dina walking along the road, uh, slowly making her way back to Jackson, when Ellie appears behind her at a trot. Dina looks at her relieved and says, I was so worried about you. But she rides the horse straight past her, ignoring the fact that Dina's there, and she leaves Dina to walk the rest of the way. And so then, on that bitter note, the credits roll. And as one final post credit scene, we see the Fedra soldiers walking over all the bodies of the fireflies in the stadium, then General Redgrave looking at the remnants of the battle and saying something like, let's get to work. And this way, we set up a natural villain for the next game as this unstoppable Fedra army and this ruthless general will be the antagonists in The Last of Us Part 3. It's hard to rewrite a story when a lot of people loved the original one, but I think a story like this would have divided the fanbase far less than the one we got. Uh, but what do you think? I'd love to know what you would have done differently in the comments down below. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time on The Closer Look.